the time. Yep. Um, Lisa, Jack, I'd really like John to go. Um, he's come from D.C. and he's probably on East Coast yeah. time. Plus, there's all just being in D.C. Absolutely. <laughs> so we'll still go today. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. All right. John, you ready? I am. Thanks. I'm really hoping you didn't have a flight home tonight. I know. Good deal. I've learned to expect uh, flexibility. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, and we appreciate that. You know how we are. We like to duck. Try to uh, stick to the high points of this. The detail is in the slides that are in your system. So if there's some, an issue that you're particularly interested in, the more detail is available to you. I'm happy to <coughs> field questions as I go here. Um, hey, John. I'm wondering if that mic's not working as well. We're, we're having a hard time hearing you in the back. Try this one. Okay. Try this one. Just keep it closer. Good. Shoot a shot. Is that, is that any better? You guys have that turned up as much as you can? Or that's as good as it gets right now. <laughs> All right, well, I'll try to project my voice a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> what I want to report on today is start out, this is kind of the list of issues that I'd like to cover. As I say, I'll hit the high points as best I can so that you can move on to uh, other business. The, the starting point is I wanted to give you all sort of an initial kind of election outlook because that's really the prism through which all of these other issues that CalSTRS is concerned about that's the prism through which these other issues are viewed. And so these other issues, it's a little more of a challenge this year. The government's being run on a uh, 120 characters or less mode. So <clears throat> let me just kind of go through them uh, quickly. Um, on the election outlook in the House, the Democrats are sensing they have an historic opportunity to take back the House. Um, they have a rather daunting task ahead of them. It's hard for you to probably see all the names on the page there, but the concept of it is, is that they have to sort of, they have to pick up 24 seats in the House in order to regain control. So they not only have to win all the likely Democratic seats, they have to win the lean Democratic seats, which include uh, four Republican seats, and then they have to win all the toss-up seats, which include four Democratic seats and 15 Republican seats. So they got to knock off 15 Republican seats, some of which are open, uh, in the election in order to win. And so having run the table that far, then they've got to pick up five lean Republican seats. So it's a, it's a daunting challenge. I think the, the Democrats are feeling encouraged because they have quite a number of young and attractive candidates, uh, some military veterans, both male and female. Uh, they've raised a ton of money. Uh, there have been quite a few Republican retirements. Uh, there's really sort of a growing send Trump a message sentiment that seems to reach down even to these state government elections. But uh, before your hearts start beating too fast, can the Democrats fumble away this opportunity? Of course. They have no plan and no message on a national level. So, you know, it's, it's sort of every candidate for himself or herself. But I think there really is an opportunity, given the way the tides are, <clears throat> are going at this point. But, you know, it's February, and February is a long way out from November. So we'll just have to see. But that, that sort of tight race is going to color um, the whole consideration of legislation this year, because the Republicans aren't going to want the Democrats to be able to achieve any victories that can be pointed to in November. And likewise, the Democrats are not going to want to go along on a bipartisan legislation that will let the Republicans claim they got something done. So I think it's sort of a prescription for more of a bogging down than accomplishment. When you look over at the Senate, um, the Senate, <clears throat> the Democrats are defending far more seats than the Republicans. And I think the Republicans, you know, maybe if you ask them earlier last year, would have said, hey, this is a great opportunity to pad our lead. Well, you know, times change. And so with a 51 to 49 um, margin, 
the, the, the key thing to look at is the toss-ups, because the Democrats obviously need to hold their side on the likely and the lean Democratic, but they've got three seats right now that are in the toss-up category. Senator Heller from Nevada, and then two open seats, one in Arizona from a retiring Senator Flake and one in Tennessee. They've got to win two out of those three to get, re regain control of the Senate. But in the Senate, it takes 60 votes to do anything. So that's why they're having trouble, the Republicans are having trouble getting any sort of controversial legislation through. So it's going to be a uh, <clears throat> bare knuckle fight uh, for these open seats. And uh, again, I think uh, it's, it's too early to tell between now and uh, November will really, I think, uh, <clears throat> give a clear idea of what's going to happen. Senator McCain is in declining health. Uh, God bless him. Uh, has got the same condition that his good friend Ted Kennedy has, and so we'll just have to see. But I think, again, it makes the prospects for any major legislation in the Senate very difficult. Um, the uh, Interesting, it'll be, uh, that's on the left, the shows you the Democrats are defending 26 seats versus eight for the Republicans. Guess what? When Trump uh, comes up for re-election in 2020, it flips so that the Republicans will have 22 seats to defend and the, the Democrats only 11. So one can only imagine what that election is going to be like if Trump decides to run for re-election. So that, again, could affect the prospects in the Senate. Um, and I think the Democrats are already looking ahead to that point. So um, unless there are any questions on that, I'll move up to tax reform. And just to quickly, I know you've read a lot in the journal and other places, but just the, the key elements of the tax reform platform from the business investment perspective. One big drop in the corporate rate, a drop in the rate of small business taxation. They operate in the so-called pass-through form, LLCs, partnerships, that sort of thing. They get a rate cut. Uh, one of the most uh, prime pumping, uh, pump priming, I should say, uh, features was the ability to write off on a current basis um, all purchases of capital equipment. I mean, that's just an enormous change, and is already having an impact. It's just for the. It's just for five years. So there's a lot of kind of running out and buying stuff, and that's seen as pumping up the economy. Of course, you know, you've already got an economy approaching uh, full employment, so people get nervous about interest rates rise, and all of a sudden we're off to the races in the market. So um, it's interesting how interconnected everything is. The territorial tax system, overseas income, a U.S. multinational is no longer taxed, and then they can bring home these existing earnings that they built up to reinvest in the United States, i.e., you know, pay dividends, give CEO pay packages, and have share buybacks. So, But the one thing I wanted to kind of call your attention to is that <clears throat> tax bills, tax reform bills, you wouldn't have thought we'd necessarily have a big dog in the fight, but it turned out we had a very big dog in the fight. And this was something they ran these bills through beginning in November in about six weeks through the entire Congress. So there wasn't much time to alert you. But <clears throat> the potential um, hammer that uh, we faced is the so-called UBIT issue. And the UBIT is the acronym for the Unrelated Business Income Tax. It, it supplies generally when a tax exempt organization sort of ventures beyond its tax exempt mission and starts getting involved in commercial activities. It grew out of the famous case of NYU owned the Mueller Spaghetti Factory. And so at that time, Mueller was under NYU's tax exemption. It wasn't paying any tax on its spaghetti. So all the other spaghetti manufacturers didn't like that, so they ganged up and they had the law changed so that if a, if a tax exempt organization was starting to venture a field, they would face this tax. Well. The House Ways and Means Committee tax staff, which still has several alumni of the uh, Nunez Pepta bill, um, decided to impose this unrelated business income tax at a rate of 39.6%, which is pretty steep, on the investment income of CalSTRS and other state and local plans from investments that relied to a significant extent on debt, so private equity, infrastructure, real estate. and so. <clears throat> it would have had a pretty dire impact on the plan because, as you know, more than 60 cents of every benefit dollar is financed by investment earnings. Well, if you're lopping off a 39.6% tax off the top of it, that could have a real draconian impact. But I, I have to say that <clears throat> I really think that this is a situation in which CalSTRS did more than its part and worked very effectively with uh, 
the national groups and the what's really a tremendous grassroots network of plans that have influential state and local officials who in turn have good relations with folks on the Hill. So Cal Sturr sent a personal letter to every member of the California delegation, House and Senate. We did outreach to the House Majority Leader, Mr. McCarthy, with whom we've worked for years on Elk Hills, who uh, has a good relationship with Elk Hills. And then coordinated with NASR and NCTR, because it's kind of a hearty few in Washington, um, to you know undertake strategy and, and uh, help or organize the grassroots. And that's really the great strength of the public plan community when you get in a jam like this. So for example, Utah, the Utah State Treasurer turned out to be a very influential person with the uh, Senate Finance Committee Chairman Hatch. He's Republican, they talk the same language. The Utah System Director got involved and really made some very effective outreach with Senator Hatch. Uh, the Wisconsin System reached out to House Speaker uh, Ryan and then House Weech Ways and Means Chairman Brady faced a visit from the Houston Police and Fire. And if any of you ever dealt with the public safety unions, you can know that they are <clears throat> direct, as, as we shall say. <laughs> so anyway, this was a very, I think, a very effective effort that NASR and NCTR uh, helped lead, that we you know, contributed more than our share to the effort. So what happened? Well, House passed this bill going after us. The Senate, as a result of this outreach from the state, um, Senator and a, a several other influential members of the Finance Committee heard from their states as well, decided not to include this provision in the bill. So after the Senate, it's in the House bill, not in the Senate bill, they go to conference, House Senate conference, which is intended to meld the two bills, write final legislation. And it was there, there was like a, the same fight all over again. The House Ways and Means staff kept trying to put this back in. And so again, we, you know, intervened with the House Majority Leader and Ultimately, uh, House Speaker Ryan had to step in and say, no, this can't be in the bill. So it was an important uh, victory for the public plan community, and I think one that didn't get as much attention just given the fact that this, these bills are just being sort of rammed through. Um, one of the areas I wanted to talk about, <clears throat> because some of them may come back, are the dogs that didn't bark for public plans in the tax reform bill. And the first is this concept of quote unquote, Rothification. One of the original big revenue raisers for the House Ways and Means Republican tax reform bill was to take the current tax deduction, 401ks, 403bs, 457, and cut it way back and say, okay, you're gonna get this $2,400 deduction. Everything else has gotta be paid in after-tax dollars. And of course, when you retire eons later, it'll be tax-free. And so, you know, just imagine, you know, you're reading these articles, article after article about how people are just not saving enough in their, in their supplemental retirement plans or in their basic retirement plan. Here, here comes a proposal um, to whack back the deduction to $2,400. This is one tweet from President Trump that you would agree with. He said, we're not touching your 401ks. And as soon as he said that, this effort on the Hill, this wind went out of its sails. Two of the other dogs that didn't bark uh, were concerns that they were talking about reforming the retirement savings area. And anytime you start hearing simplification and streamlining, you get nervous because we've got all these special rules that we've spent the last 20 years getting in the code that address you know, unique qualities of public plans. Well, you start having a one-size-fits-all approach and suddenly we find ourselves subject to the funding rules, these special rules on benefit limitations. Um, go away. And so the same thing, there have been various proposals to consolidate the supplemental retirement plans. You know, why do we have all these 401k, 403b, 457? Why don't we just have one plan? Well, you know, that sends shivers up the spine of the people that have 457 plans that have all these little unique features. Same thing with 403bs. I think we have to be vigilant because the Ways and Means Committee has said they're going to come back to the retirement savings area to try to simplify and streamline. And so that's an area I think it will be done probably on a more bipartisan basis, but we have to be watchful. Employer pickups, that was another potential revenue raiser that was on the table. Again, it's designed to mimic the private sector where the employer's making all of the, the contributions and so it's never income to the employee, but the federal government workers, they do their employee contributions on an after-tax basis. So we've always been nervous about that. Happily, it didn't come up and I'm happy to say even though the Ways and Means Committee would have repealed this deduction in the end, 
<clears throat> the teachers apparently have sway with the Senate Finance Committee because they restored it so that they kept the $250 deduction for teachers that buy supplies out of their own pockets. So, you know, it may seem modest, but, you know, every bit helps, obviously. So um, interrupt me if you have questions. I'm trying to kind of get you out of school here early. Um, Dodd-Frank, investor protection. <clears throat> this is an area where we've been fighting the good fight ever since the Dodd-Frank was adopted and the, and the uh, House flipped to Republican control. And the starting point is this bill, the Financial Choice Act. I think the, the House Financial Services Committee is going for the record on the most number of bills that have a title that's the exact opposite of what they do. So anytime you hear a sort of protection or transparency, you know it's going to something to worry about. But it basically would, it would gut all the corporate governance reforms, take away proxy access authority in the SEC, it cut back, say, on pay. Um, it raises the exemption from Sarbanes-Oxley controls that have been very effective. It would impose new reg, uh, uh, regulation of proxy access firms. Really, the, it's a kind of a, um, uh, uh, a kind of a subterfuge to try to inject the corporate community into the, the proxy advisory area. They're saying, well, you got to send this out for review and comment by the company that's affected, and you have to include their views and all that stuff. So they're trying to regulate. This relationship you have with your vendors that, you know, we're not calling for this sort of thing. We don't need any regulation of these guys. So they do that on the, on the one hand, and then on, they turn around and say, okay, but, you know, these, all this current regulation of investment advisors or private equity funds, oh, we don't need that. That's, that's too much regulation, you know. Why should we be regulating your own vendors, you know? Well, figure it out. <clears throat> so there's sort of a theme to all of this. Um, again... Calster's legislative response, you know, you got to make do with what you have, but you got to answer the bell each time. I mean, Maxine Waters, as you know, we've, we've established a very good relationship with her. She's the ranking Democrat on the House Financial Services Committee. She'd be chairman if the House flips. She's indefatigable. She has a great staff. And for each of these bills, she's putting out the list of concerns. And so uh, Ann Sheehan and Aisha, the, the investment staff, have been very effective in putting, working with me to put together these letters that outline the concerns that Calsters have has with these these bills that uh, undercut investment protection, and it gives it gives her something to wave around in the committee, it gives her something to wave around on the floor, because you, you know you, you can't let these bills just sort of go through unchallenged, because then it becomes the order of the day. You've got to list all the problems that they have, and uh, you know make those concerns heard. The bill is now it, it went through the House on a party line vote. <clears throat> Happily, it takes 60 votes in the Senate to do anything big, so they're not going to get nine Democrats to sign on. They've decided to go with a much more modest package of Dodd-Frank changes that are focused on community banking. Um, on the regulatory side, you know, Trump made this big deal about you know rolling back regulations. Well, the reality of it is in this area is a lot of the uh, affected institutions have already spent millions of dollars complying with these rules, and the last thing they want to do is have the rules start changing again. So, I think the great bulk of What's in place now for the financial regulation under Dodd-Frank will continue to be there. There are specific areas, you know, the Volcker rule on uh, uh, you know, trading in investment houses, you know, maybe that'll be uh, pared back. But I think in the main, uh, we're pr in pretty good shape on the regulatory side. Um, the DOL fiduciary rule is, is really of interest to our members and their supplemental savings. Uh, supplementing, supplemental savings side, as you know, as we've discussed in prior meetings, the Labor Department adopted this controversial best interest rule for retirement by saying the investment advisor had a fiduciary rule to act in the client's best interest. And, you know, you see these polls where 75% of the people polled were shocked to discover that wasn't the rule already. Um, but in any event, um, they adopted a whole series of <clears throat> rules about, you know, mitigating conflicts, disclosing them, uh, regulating the kinds of uh, compensation arrangements. So when Trump came in, they immediately uh, suspended uh, having this rule go into effect to study it further, and then extended the suspension again. Ultimately, they decided to let the best interest standard go into effect in January, June 17th, but they said, okay, but enforcement mechanisms, 
you know, the contracts and stuff that's supposed to kind of really implement this thing, we're going to delay that till July 19th. So it's being known as the honor system now for what it's worth. But I think the, the, the reality is that <clears throat> we sort of crossed the Rubicon on this issue because um, the, uh, the investment advisory firms have, you know, they can't wait till the day it goes into effect. So they've kind of like what we were hearing just a little while ago, they got to start setting up the systems to implement this sort of thing. And there are a number of them that have sort of embraced best interests as a marketing technique. So I think we're, there's no going back on it. Um, the Republicans on the Hill have been unable to uh, muster the 60 votes necessary to overturn it. The new sort of wild card is that <clears throat> at long last, the SEC is preparing to come on the field in this area. And they are um, in the process of trying to write a rule that would apply the fiduciary, you know, kind of best interest standard across the board in all brokerage accounts, not just limited retirement advice. And so they've been quite closed mouthed about uh, what they're up to. Um, and the rules, there's been talk, they could come out as early as the second quarter of 2018. I think that's ambitious because you have several new SEC commissioners, but it's something that we'll continue to watch. There'll be a review and comment period if uh, Calsters decides to file any thoughts on that. Um, because I do think this is a huge issue for our members and just, you know, mm -hmm. for retirement security, thinking about, uh, well, first of all, I just find this whole thing crazy. <laughs> I just, yeah. I, I find it bizarre when I found out they're not fiduciaries. Wait a minute. So I think it's always shocking when people realize that this isn't the sort of the, the way know, it's supposed rule to be. of thumb, right? Right. Um, so, so if, so if and when hopefully this is implemented, is it the SEC's job then to make sure that it's it's being well? It'll be an interesting. Applied, it'll be, I, we'll have to see how it actually kind of works out because the Labor Department rule will come into you know the, the enforcement mechanisms will come into effect if left unchanged. So you'll you'll have the Labor Department sort of regulating it from the retirement perspective. The question is, will the SEC if they come out with an across the board regulation? I think probably as a practical matter, since they're sort of the primary regulator of these investment advisors, their approach is going to trump the, um, the Labor Department approach. But it sort of depends. I mean, if they have kind of a little different standard, or they have... so um, I think that's. I always hear how like how over understaffed and overwhelmed the SEC is, and I just wonder practically for the regular Joe, you know, who gets an email. Like I just got from my college saying, hey, you know, I can help you with your CalSERS retirement from some yeah. money manager you know, yeah. who wants to get me a pizza and sell me a product or something. How, how will that change? I, I well, guess. I think it's, it's kind of to be determined. I mean, I think that um, to the extent it's investment advice and the, and the labor department rule kind of goes into effect, then there'll be enforcement mechanisms. There'll be a contract you have to sign with a guy and he'd have to, you know, vow to do all these noble things. But if the SEC regulation comes in, it's more of a light touch regulation, then that's that's going to be an interesting sort of question, I guess. Um, <clears throat> you know, that, as I say, the uh, there have been some investment houses that have just, you know, that have just, uh, you know, said, look, this is what we're going to apply. This is the way our folks are all going to work. They've changed their compensation systems. They've changed the way the fees work. So it's going to be an interesting, both sort of a regulatory shakeout, I guess, if the standards are sort of different or they don't mesh well. Uh, and it's going to be an interesting sort of business shakeout about are people still... The market will speak. People will realize that you, know, you want to go to the folks who... Yeah, I mean, they, you know, it seems like it'd be a marketing advantage to say, well, I'm really, I'm bound under the standard. I've accepted it, and here's all the ways I'm going to comply with it, and come visit me. And people are doing that, especially at the, re you know, the really small retail level. So... I think it's one that's you know to be determined, but um, at least there is activity. You know, it's not the wild west anymore. So, um, <clears throat> just moving on. Social Security. I only bring up mandatory coverage because it's so important to us. But happily, there's not much to report uh, there, uh, especially in this close election year. No one's going to be stepping on that third rail. But uh, you know, we just have. To, the big thing is, is that they bring these people in, and it's a positive revenue raiser forever, even when they retire. That's that was the change in the scoring about you know, five or six years ago that really made this even more of a concern. But happily, 
not one that's taken up by Congress. Unfortunately, the uh, <clears throat> WEP repeal proposal, bipartisan, you would think when you have the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee and the ranking Democrat in the Ways and Means Committee, you could get something done. Um, this bill, as you may recall, it would change the way the WEP offset was calculated. And right now, it's this kind of arbitrary formula. There are all these you know, cliffs and kind of perverse aspects. This would take a much more sort of rational approach, figure it out based on your actual work history, and then provide relief from the WEP so determined. The problem was is that Chairman Brady decreed that any revenue that this lost would have to come from kind of the, the same sector, if you will. And so it originally been paid for by going after people that should have been subject to the WEP that weren't. And of course, the political optics of shaking down old ladies for ten thousand dollars or twenty thousand dollars when they've been, you know, they're seven years old and they've been retired for fifteen years, you know, that's not real appealing. So they dropped that. But the trouble is, when they dropped that, then they, the the WEP relief went from fifty percent of the WEP penalty um, being relieved to fifteen percent. So then all the employee groups sort of fell off the wagon, and no one's really come up with a way to pay for it. I mean, they can do it trillion and a half tax bill, they can do a $500 billion spending bill, but, you know, can't find a couple hundred million bucks to take care of this. So, so John, do you think the fact that Maine's taking a look at coming back into Social Security is going to inspire anybody to try pushing this mandatory somewhere down the line? To try to push? Mandatory Social Security? Um, I don't know. You know, the, I think we've been, if we, the public plan community, have been effective in communicating the employer cost argument. That's mm -hmm. really the one that, you know, we can go all through this, you know, these gyrations of unfairness and right. that sort of thing. But dollars and cents of how, you know, a CalSTRS is delivered benefit because you can rely on investment earnings that are not, you know, zero, which is kind of the way the Social Security works. You can deliver it so much more cheaply. That kind of wins the day. And going to say to a member, well, gosh, you do this and the cost right. of provide, covering our employees is going to go way up. Um, the thing I've always feared about is that if the the mandatory, the, the bone for mandatory would be they'd give great relief on offsets for the current participants, and so happily we haven't gotten into that sort right, of devil's right, right. choice. Yep, um, yep, yep. Already, but it's you. important to you know be aware of these really issues. Because anytime they talk about it. entitlement reforms, you know, it, it, these trade offs can be you know on the table. So um, <laughs> just last couple things, Pepta. As I'm sure you're undoubtedly aware, uh, Demon Nunes has been uh, creating mischief in other quarters of the government. So uh, he's kind of forgotten about this bill and has sort of lost interest. And so I think we can kind of cross it off our list for now. But I wanted to just sort of touch upon it. A little scary to think because the ways and means, uh, the uh, House Republicans have adopted these six year term limits on chairmanships. And so Chairman Brady's got a couple years left. and. Uh, Guess who's next in line to be chairman of Ways and Means? Our friend Mr. Nunn is. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, food for thought. Uh, uh, Sharon had asked me from sort of a benefits and services perspective to give kind of an update on uh, the outlook for health care legislation in the Congress in, in the coming year. I guess I would say uh, on the positive side, at the, the House Senate GOP retreat that they had last week, they've decided to move on from trying to repeal Obamacare. They realize they don't have the votes. They lost the special election in Alabama in the Senate, so they have even fewer votes. And so they seem to formally um, declare giving up on it. So what does that really mean? <clears throat> There's a bipartisan effort to try to do something around the edges in the near term to help stabilize these exchanges, which you know are surprisingly perky given all the efforts by the administration to try to undercut them. Um, and these are modest things. I mean, you know, continuing these cost sharing reduction payments, which help low income people with their co pays, their deductibles. They have the concept of this uh, <clears throat> invisible risk pool. It's worked real well in Maine and Alaska, where the state sort of reinsures the premiums of the really sick in the, in the state as a way of trying to hold down the premiums for everybody else. They've got a new catastrophic plan that's aimed at the younger people, you know, high deductibles. Uh, lower premiums, but you know, it's stuff around the edges. And uh, they, there was a study that came out today that said uh, states like California, where it's the state that runs the exchange, those are actually doing pretty well because you've got you know, people that are committed to the cause running the program. Well, not so much at the federal level because 
the administration, you know, cut the enrollment period in half. They did away with the outreach efforts to get people to sign up. And yet there was still a pretty uh, sizable chunk. So, you know, I think uh, <clears throat> that the outlook going forward for healthcare legislation is very uncertain. Um, clearly the CBO and all the various analyses of the repeals proposal said, look, it's not in this death spiral. It's actually, you know, fairly stable, but you know, if the administration keeps trying to undercut the, 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 the states that use the federal exchange, then you know, this is a very complicated quadratic equation sort of thing, and um, <clears throat> you know, things could start to come apart, but for the moment, there's at least some stability, but it also means that for your purposes, you know, not much help is coming from Washington, so. Um, uh, I'm sorry, and I didn't realize this happened. So the federal, so the, the the feds are actually running some of the exchanges. Yeah, what the, the way the way it works in California, you know, acted right. properly as did some of the other far sighted states and set up their own state exchanges. And for those states, primarily red states, that didn't set up the exchanges, then those the residents of those states buy their uh, by affordable care insurance through the federal government exchange. And uh, you know, under Obama, that was you know run very. Uh, you know, aggressively and tried to really uh, encourage people to sign up and, you know, well managed. But, you know, the crowd that's in there now, I mean, it's death by a thousand cuts. So so the the federal program just does it for the people that aren't able to get it through a state right. exchange, not necessarily that the states contract with the feds to do it for the state when they don't want to do it themselves. Well, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. It's basically it's where the states are not running it themselves and they've right. chosen to sort of elect to have the you know, either by, def either by default or uh, it could be by contract. I, yeah. I, I don't know the answer so it was to by it. contract, that might be a source of income for states that But, do you know, in the, in the tax bill, they repealed the requirement that everyone had to have insurance. Yeah, that's and, true. And so, and surprisingly, most people think they have to have insurance. It's, it's interesting because they did a poll on the people were they going to just rush out and drop their, well, no, you know, so yeah. it's funny, funny how stuff works. You know, yeah. it doesn't turn out the way you think it will. Sure. Um, John, with the um, you know with the tax reform and the individual mandate going away, I understood that correctly, right? Through the tax reform, yeah, the individual I, mandate went away. Yeah. So with the death by, I guess I'm just I, I just thought that was sort of the death knell for for Obamacare or whatever we want to call. Well, it. that was what the Republicans and, were hoping, but apparently not. Okay, you well, know, well, apparently, I mean, because I I know for for a fact California, I mean our we're doing. Really well, well covering our people it. in California. Well, and it's interesting because some states are now thinking of adopting a, a state mandate, okay. a mandate at the state level. So, Got it. you know, it's okay. it's this is a this is a very complicated area, and it doesn't you know your pre presuppositions don't always uh, sort of work, you know. So it, it's kind of amusing actually. I mean, hopefully, you know, <clears throat> it doesn't cause any sort of catastrophic drop in enrollment. But you know, they did this in December, and people. I guess most of the people are already signed up, but still, I, you don't get the sense that, <clears throat> uh, you know, if they if they try to do they try to do the same thing on the employer mandate, you know, and that that could be a different story because if employers drop coverage, then it could be a problem. Mm -hmm. Health care. Yeah, at least, at least this so. this provides a sort of a vehicle because I mean the early years when I was coming out here I'd have nothing to show for it and that yeah. you know we talk about the years between retirement and Medicare and those are tough years for a lot of people. This at least provides some some vehicle. I mean it's, it can be expensive depending on things, but then the subsidies can figure in. So at least there's something available on it. But I can't say that there's any commitment to. Well, I think you need another underwriting cycle. On without the mandate, just know yeah. <laughs> what enrollment would look like next time. I mean, if the if the underwriting is so poor that it, it'll drive the rates crazy. Yeah, and and there's so many various there's so many factors affecting the rates too. So I, I agree with Jack. Um, uh, <clears throat> just two last topics here. Um, <clears throat> infrastructure. I mean, this is an area that I know Chris and the investment shop have been interested in. Your going overseas to find infrastructure investment opportunities. Um, <clears throat> the president made a big pitch for his, quote, plan in the um, State of the Union address. 
but there have been much in the way of detail so far, especially about investment opportunities. I mean, sort of ironically, uh, Trump is his own worst enemy in many respects, but one of them is he hasn't appointed any sub-cabinet people. So you got the you got the secretary of the department, and you get all the career people, but the the people would be in charge of developing new ideas, developing policy, are just not there. Because he's saying, why do we have to have all these people on top of people? Well, this is a perfect example of, you know, there's just no rollout of a detailed program. And when is that coming? Who knows? But the details that have come out so far, I mean, it just seems to be sort of never, never land. The federal government's going to, a $1.5 trillion plan that they may contribute only $200 million to. And they're talking about flipping the federal share of, of infrastructure projects at the state levels. The federal cost share has usually been about 80%, and the state and local government picking up 20. Well, Trump's talking about flipping that. Now, where is the state going to find you know, an 80% contribution? Well, you would think that you know, public-private partnerships might offer at least some potential private capital, but you know, this is just it was a kind of a classic Trump. They have all the GOP leadership House and Senate out to Camp David with the president, with the whole president's economic team. Gary Cohen gets up, national economic chairman, uh, national economic uh, com uh, committee chairman, um, sort of head policy, economic policy maker in the White House. He has this long, you know, rendition of uh, why public partnerships are so great and they'd be a central feature of the, of the program. And Trump says, well, I haven't read that. I, I don't think they're gonna work. So, you know, not so much. So you're kind of left to wonder, you know, what's the real answer going to be? But I mean, you don't, you don't get the sense that they're talking about opportunities for institutional investors to come on the field. I mean, they're not talking about taxable bonds. There's some activity in the private activity bond area that would kind of loosen up the restrictions on, you know, state volume caps and do things to let those be more uh, flexibly used. Tax exempt financing has always been a stellar source for infrastructure, but. Um, you know, they don't address the question of how are you going to pay for it all? It's going to cost $1.5 trillion. So who knows? I mean, there's some talk that maybe infrastructure can get done this year because it obviously has bipartisan appeal. I mean, every member in every district has, you know, roads and bridges that need to be repaired. But it's just, I think this falls into the category that the, the you know, the Democrats don't want to give the Republicans a victory and the Republicans don't want to give the Democrats a victory. So does that end up sort of ending up a stalemate? So we'll see. But we're following it. There's an opportunity for institutional investors to sort of come on the field. We'll certainly alert you all to that. And the last area, just real quickly, is um, class action reform legislation. Reform is a word that's lost any possible meeting in Washington. Uh, it just means that, you know, you want to take something away from somebody. And so in this bill, <clears throat> it's... Um, it's claimed to be aimed at these class actions, you know, where you get them in the mail, $1.98, you know, coupon to go, you know, buy a nine volt battery at CVS or something. And when, when in reality, what they're doing is they're imposing restrictions that could really curtail the ability of uh, 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 conduct class action securities litigation because they're imposing this requirement that you gotta have the same, everyone in the, everybody in the entire class has to have the same type and scope of injury. Well, you know, it doesn't sound so bad. Out there. But if, you know, if you have a company that's put out misleading information, you know, that's been out there for a couple months, people have, have traded all kinds of different prices, different shares, different losses, you know, how are you ever going to say that's the same scope of injury? So these little subtle ways they throw logs in the path, you know, they, the whole class action has to grind to a halt while they're litigating whether it's a class or not. If you're a class, a class representative can't use the same lawyer using the last class action. You know, what's the purpose of that other than just, you know, throw a log in the path? So um, this is an area where <clears throat> we, as I say, we always make use of all the resources we have. Uh, the investment staff put together a, a letter, uh, you know, laying out all these uh, problems and sent it over. It passed, of course, it passed in the House by a party line vote. Um, but it over, went over to the Senate. Well, guess where it landed? It landed in the lap of uh, Senator Feinstein, who's the ranking member of the Judiciary <coughs> Committee. So we sent her a letter, and I think that's going to be the end of it. So um, happily, she's uh, well positioned. She helped us a lot on Elk Hills, and now on the Judiciary Committee, she's in position to help us on this. So anyway, I'm happy to field any questions. Uh, again, there's more detail on the slides, but I.
I was conscious having school get out a little earlier here. So. <laughs> Thanks, John, and thank you for coming all the way out and sure. being with us all day. It's always, uh, always great to be with you and kind of find out the challenges that you're facing, so appreciate it. Some of this stuff that you've talked about tonight is pretty insane. Well, you feel, right. like, you feel like the turning back the clock. I mean, that's one of the things that's yeah. so sort of sad. Um, but, you know. Absolutely. All right, oh. any questions for John? All righty. Thank you very much. We appreciate it.